Stein is one of the most important composers of the 20th century. A pioneer in the field of contemporary American music, Fine was exceptional in that she managed to find success as a composer, not only as a woman in a male-dominated field, but during a time when American composers were struggling to find a voice in music that was considered as relevant as that of the Europeans. Fine recalled, we were forging a new kind of music. Maybe not all of it was great, but it was an exciting time then. It was a completely different scene when you realized you were pioneering with what you were doing. There was a lot of talk then of what is American music? Although Fine was quite prolific, producing more than 140 compositions of great quality, her music is rarely performed today and many musicians remain unfamiliar with her work. This can perhaps be attributed to the fact that her work is difficult to categorize. Over the course of her 70 years composing, Fine experimented with a multitude of styles. According to Henry Brandt, no two fine pieces are alike, either in subject matter or instrumentation. Each new work appears to generate its own style appropriate to the subject, and there are no mannerisms which persist from work to work. This is certainly true of both of Fine's solo flute works, The Flicker and Emily's Images. Vivian Fine composed only two solo flute works, both during the latter part of her career, at a time when she had firmly established her voice and her career as a composer. The Flicker for solo flute or piano right hand was composed in 1973 during Fine's years teaching at Bennington College in Vermont. And Emily's Images for flute and piano was composed the year she retired from her teaching duties in 1987. Both works emphasize the highly dramatic nature of Fine's compositions, yet offer glimpses into her style from vastly different points of view. The flicker served as a source of inspiration for Emily's images. However, these pieces share little common ground. Contrapuntal writing was a key element of Fine's compositional style, as was melodic line. The work for flute and piano is the more obvious example of the contrapuntal aspect of Fine's writing, while the piece for solo flute is an extraordinary example of how, through quick changes of register, length and frequency of note, and specifically placed dynamics, accents, and articulations, Fine was able to both disguise and draw out multiple melodic lines, further emphasizing her contrapuntal prowess. The flight of the flicker, a type of woodpecker, is dramatized in her piece for solo flute, while Fine drew upon the literature of Emily Dickinson as the inspiration behind the tone poems that comprise Emily's images. In addition to their dramatic flair, both works require an incredible technical virtuosity. This is especially apparent in the flicker, which is nothing short of a virtuosic showpiece. Although both pieces are capable of standing on their own in concert, it is useful for the flutist to have an awareness of Fine's background, her feisty personality, and how her compositional style evolved over the course of her career. Vivian Fine was born in 1913 to Russian Jewish immigrants in Chicago. She was a piano prodigy and at age five received a scholarship to study at the Chicago Musical College.
Fine began private piano studies with Dijen Lavoyherz, a former pupil of Alexander Scriabin, at age 11. Madame Hertz thought Fine should have formal theory and harmony lessons and introduced her to Ruth Crawford, later Ruth Crawford Seeger, with whom Fine studied for four years. It was Ruth Crawford's influence in particular that had a tremendous impact upon Fine, who said, having an avant-garde composer as my teacher, it made me feel that it was completely natural to be a woman and to be writing adventurous music. Six months into their studies together, in 1927, Crawford asked Fine to compose her first written piece, Lullaby, for solo piano, and this began Fine's lifelong obsession with composing. support of her parents, Vivian Fine quit going to school at age 14, remarking that she couldn't be bothered with such things as memorizing how many post offices there were in the United States. in Crawford's footsteps, Fine moved to New York in 1931. Once there, she became the only woman member of Aaron Copland's Young Composers Group, premiering many of the ultra-modern works and establishing her reputation as performer. Fine composed and performed her own works in addition to those of the other members of the group. In New York, Fine supported herself as dance accompanist, which led to many future collaborations most notably with Doris Humphrey and Martha Graham. She was presented with opportunities to compose original music for dance and wrote many dance scores during these years. Although Fine's association with dance in New York was born out of financial necessity, her work for dance thrust her into the spotlight and is largely responsible for launching her career. The Great Depression of 1934 marked an end to the ultra-modern movement, impacting Fine's compositional style significantly. Many avant-garde composers either abandoned composing altogether, as did Ruth Crawford, or, like Copland, shifted to a more tonal compositional style. Fine fell into this latter group, and she began studies with Roger Sessions who displayed virtually no interest in her avant-garde compositions. Through her lessons with Sessions, Fine received a thorough education in more traditional compositional techniques and the fundamentals of tonal harmony. 
Fine said what she most gained through her studies with sessions was a greater awareness of consistent musical thought. Eventually, Fine would merge this more traditional tonal training with her prior atonal tendencies. It was during this time that Vivian Fine married sculptor Benjamin Karp and started a family. They had two daughters together, Peggy and Nina. Fine felt that since she already had an identity as a composer and pianist, she should keep her maiden name. Vivian Fine's music can be divided into three primary style periods. The music of her first period, from her first written piece in 1927 until 1933, is highly dissonant and entirely atonal, a reflection of her earliest influences of Ruth Crawford and Madame Herz. <laughs> Henry Cowell remarked that Fine wrote in the grimmest of musical styles and in a manner which was quite unladylike. Fine recalled, I would not allow a sense of tonality in my music. With the brashness of youth, I was very brash. <laughs> The music of her second period, from 1934 until 1945, is more tonally oriented, a direct reflection of her studies with Roger Sessions during the Depression and her work as dance accompanist. <laughs> After eight years of studying tonal harmony, Fine decided she was ready to work on her own, and she began to search for her own compositional voice, a voice she admitted to having compromised during her studies with Sessions. This third period of Fine's development is significant, spanning a period of nearly 50 years, beginning in 1945 and lasting through her final completed work in 1994. <laughs> In 
first years since embarking on her own, Fine experimented with various atonal compositional techniques. She wrote for unusual combinations of instruments, including the use of a lawnmower in one piece, abandoned key signatures, and began using dissonance more freely. Fine said, I began to return to a less tonally oriented idiom. It was really the beginning of what was the basis of the rest of my musical language. They have tonal centers. You feel tonality, but it is not in the traditional harmony using triads. I wasn't conscious of the reasons that compelled me in that direction, but I evidently must have felt some need to move away from the tonal idiom. There isn't a reasoned decision about it. I just began to hear a different kind of music. Although Fine tried to experiment with 12-tone technique, she said, I could never get myself to reach the point where I could stick with it or be locked into it. It just was not for me. Instead, she elected to draw upon certain serial procedures and the techniques of inversion, retrograde, and canons became prominent features of her future works, including Emily's images. During her years teaching at Bennington College in Vermont, Fine's productivity increased significantly. Fine recalled, I began to compose more because for one thing, I didn't have to shop around to find a place for them to be played. I had that situation where my works were going to be performed. This was a wonderful thing to me, and performances give you energy and impetus. Fine also composed a number of large-scale works during this period, a result of her numerous grants and commissions. In 1980, she was elected to the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters and received a Guggenheim Fellowship. Numerous commissions followed these accolades. Most notable was the San Francisco Symphony's commission of her drama for orchestra in 1982, the first major commission in its 72-year history to a woman composer a piece which was then runner-up for the Pulitzer Prize. The San Francisco Symphony made the premiere the centerpiece of a week-long event, Vivian Fine Week, from January 5th to 13th, 1983, devoted entirely to performances of her music, including many of her earlier works, which had not been performed in decades. The final years of Fine's compositional career are marked by her retirement from Bennington College in 1987. Her compositions from this point forward display her tendency to self-borrow. Some works were previous compositions that she simply rescored using new instrumentation, while others featured material and techniques used in her previous works. Fine explains that since compositions were often only heard once, she had no objections to rewriting for different instrumentation. My first commission, and from the USA,
Vivian Fine's final completed work, Memoirs of Juliana Rooney in 1994, is a semi-autobiographical chamber opera that tells the story of a fictitious, feisty, feminist American composer. Great news. I'm the union organizer for the Midwest. We move back to your home territory next week. What do I do then? How do I work? You don't get it, do you? I got a great job, a regular salary. My wife doesn't have to work anymore. What does she have to do? Be a red-blooded American woman. Be all you can be. Be a housewife to me and one day or other our, our kid's mother. It is fitting that Fine incorporated recycled material throughout the work, which features excerpts of works from each period of her career. I'm about to write a ballet. You don't say no way. Pack your suitcases, big. We're gonna live like the rest of the USA. Fine, fully aware of her status as a designated woman composer, used the opera as an opportunity to reflect upon her own personal experiences as such throughout her career, speaking through the fictitious character of Juliana, who, at one point in the opera, speaks these words along with a quote attributed to composer Ellen Tafe Swillich. Now, how do I screw up the courage to be a composer? Amid the European greats, the heavyweights. I have three huge handicaps. I'm American, I'm a woman, and I'm alive. Flicker for solo flute, composed in 1973, represents one of the rare occasions that Vivian Fine composed a solo piece for an instrument other than piano, though she does indicate the piece could be performed for piano right hand. Inspiration for the piece came from a flicker outside the window of her Bennington home. It comes as no surprise that Fine chose the flute to depict birdsong. In the notes to the score, ornithologist Roger Tory Peterson described the bird's flight as deeply undulating produced by several quick beats and a pause.
Klein gives instructions at the end of the piece for the performer to slowly lift and turn head and eyes as if following an ascending trajectory disappearing into space, holding final position for a moment. Instructions which further emphasize the dramatic nature of this piece. The Flicker is written as a one movement work that is improvisatory in nature. This piece is through composed with virtually no repetition of material. The flicker is comprised of several short sections, including an introduction, a cadenza, and a coda. Perpetual 16th notes in asymmetrical groupings dominate. However, several short motives are present and combined at various points throughout the piece. Each of these motives is marked by a sudden change in tempo. Each section begins with the asymmetrical 16th note material and ends of larger sections are pronounced through a mixture of extreme register, either highest or lowest, and longer values of notes with or without fermatas. It is the varied groupings of 16th notes coupled with swift changes in register that provides the momentum for the line and creates the sense of perpetual motion. This perpetual motion is briefly interrupted at various points throughout the piece through either brief pause or the interjection of short motivic material, such as tremolos and trills, sharply articulated quarter notes, dotted rhythms, and more lyrical passage of slower ascending or descending notes. Bar lines are used mainly as a way of distinguishing between gestures of musical thought. Fine indicates a performance time of only four minutes in the score, yet recorded performance times average at eight minutes. Quite a significant difference. Perhaps it is simply a misprint in the score, or perhaps Fine was a bit unrealistic in her tempi markings in relation to the technical capabilities of performers. Fine reported that she wrote what I heard, which was the imagined flight and song of this active bird.
Fine drew upon the poetry of Emily Dickinson as inspiration for Emily's images. This work is comprised of seven super short movements. The longest is less than two minutes, each titled after and based upon the first line of an Emily Dickinson poem, which she selected simply by reading through the index. The titles are A Spider Sewed at Night, A Clock Stopped, Not the Mantles, Exultation is the Going, the robin is a Gabriel. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The leaves, like women, interchange. A day, help, help, another day. Once she retired from Bennington, Fine began to self-borrow material from her previous works. She borrowed a small amount of material from the first page of the flicker, which she transposed at a third and used as the opening material of Emily's images. Fine described the form of Emily's images as a series of free variations with no overtly stated theme. The musical ideas themselves are the subject of the variation process. Each movement is a tone poem that portrays the image depicted by its title. The movements are united through Fine's clever use of material. Although no theme is present to connect the movements, Fine uses the material of the first movement as the basis for all the other movements. The melody of the flute line is used note for note in movements three, four, six, and seven, and is cleverly disguised through alterations in rhythm and octave displacement. No matter what method Fine used to disguise the melody, the ordering of the notes always remained constant, which further helps to create a unity among the movements, all of which are drastically different in character. The structure of the third movement flute part is a palindrome with the extended trill as the center. The sixth movement is a canon in which the piano is five notes ahead of the flute. In the second movement, the flute line abandons the notes of the opening melody and instead echoes the shape of the piano line from the first movement. The connection of the fifth movement to the other movements is less obvious, but reflects the influence of Fine's studies with sessions and serves as an example of her affinity for instrumental leader. The compositional methods Fine used in the piano part are equally as interesting. In particular, Fine writes in the first movement what appears to be complicated dotted rhythms that cross over the bar, yet the resulting rhythm is quite regular. In the final movement, Fine recombines the piano material of the first and third movements.
The fourth and center movement, the Robin is a Gabriel, is the only movement which uses flute alone. Again, choosing flute to depict birdsong. This work for flute and piano is meticulously planned throughout and demonstrates just how fine a craftswoman fine was.
Asked in 1986 if Fine envisioned her works would become a part of the standard repertoire, Vivian responded, That's a difficult question. At the moment, it doesn't look like it. Very few compositions enter the mainstream. I see how difficult it is to get performances and how little music lasts. And then things go in cycles. Some people's music disappears for a while, like Ruth Crawford's music disappeared for about 20 years. Then, after she died, about 25 or 30 years, people began to find out what a fine composer she was and began to play her music. I certainly never have one eye on immortality. One hopes to write good music, but whether it lasts or not, depends on a lot of factors. I like to get performances while I'm here. Fine's life came to a tragic end on March 20th, 2000 when she was killed instantly in a car accident in Bennington at the age of 86. Her older sister, Adelaide, was also in the car and died a few weeks later. Vivian Fine was indeed a fine composer and her works are worthy of a place in the repertoire. Fine's daughter, Peggy Karp, has made all of her mother's music available on the International Music Score Library Project website, IMSLP, in an effort to encourage future performances with the hope that her mother's music will live on.